the first speaker in this session is uh, Dr. Nandu Tilange. So he is a consultant pediatric endocrinologist uh, trained in UK and he is currently working at Algeria Children's Hospital. He is going to speak on a very important topic, uh, which is uh, approach to short stature, especially use of growth hormone in the small for gestational age babies. Uh, Dr. Th uh, Nandu, please take over. Many thanks, and uh, I'll just get into uh, full screen mode. So I hope you can see my slides. Yes, we can see it, Dr. Nandu. Excellent. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's press on. So um, what I intend to talk about is postnatal growth failure in the child born SGA. Uh, just my disclosures. Um, so uh, I was invited to do this talk by Novo Nordisk. And uh, as you'll see, uh, I've been involved in uh, the uh, diabetes and endocrine world for a long time. So I have a number of uh, uh, involvements with industry. So uh, I don't really need to tell this audience about the immediate consequences of uh, being born small for gestational age. Um, we have the uh, issue of increased perinatal mortality, hypoglycemia, obviously having been identified as being uh, IUGR, uh, premature delivery is often uh, uh, brought about. Uh, babies may have a poor APGAR score uh, at birth and may need respiratory support. They have difficulties with temperature regulation, thrombocytopenia, infection, etc. I think sometimes we think that um, SGA is a completely, uh, you know, a new part of pediatrics, you know, but I just thought I would show you this picture of Marion Chapman on the right here, who was born in 1938 uh, at home and nursed in a shoebox and fed brandy and milk using a fountain pen filler and she was kept warm with an electric light bulb rigged from a car battery uh, suspended above her shoebox. So uh, she was for many years the world record holder for low birth weight survival. Uh, and uh, the reason I know about her actually is because she sadly died when I was at medical school uh, just in her late 40s. So I, I always remembered her, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, good to know that uh, you can, from small beginnings, have good endings. She actually married and had two children. Uh, the long-term consequences of SGA uh, are numerous uh, and include impaired neurodevelopment and behavior. And I'm sure you will all be familiar with the, you know, the hyperactive, troublesome child in your clinic who's, you know, age four or five, who was uh, premature. Um, now, one very important aspect that sometimes is overlooked is the decreased bone mineral density that goes with prematurity. There's a huge amount of transfer of mineral across the placenta in the final trimester of pregnancy. So if you miss out on most of that, uh, you have osteopenia to start with. Indeed, if it's very severe, particularly if you have concurrent uh, liver disease or NEC, then you can get... Um, uh, osteopenia prematurity in the NICU when you are actually, you know, you're getting um, uh, fractures really without there being any trauma. Um, now, the, the key thing that I'm going to talk about today is short stature, but it's important to point out that only 90%, sorry, that over 90% of children who are born SJ actually grow normally. They catch up and, and they don't have a growth problem. Uh, but I'm interested in the uh, up just under 10% who, who do have a growth problem. Uh, irrespective of whether they have short stature or not, many children born SGA have early puberty, and this can actually compromise spinal height um, because they finish growing early. So they may appear to be growing satisfactorily, then have early puberty, and suddenly you've run out of time. This is particularly true in girls. In boys, there's often impaired gonadal function uh, and associated with that, undescended testes, hyperspadias, uh, sometimes micropenis also. 
Uh, renal impairment uh, is an important consideration as you grow older. If you're born very small, you have small kidneys and uh, you have less renal reserve. And um, one of the things that is entrained by SGA, this uh, essentially in utero starvation uh, for the most part, is that um, the child learns, literally epigenetically uh, learns, uh, to hold on to uh, energy more avidly. They secrete more insulin for a given amount of carbohydrate. And this uh, essentially leads to features of insulin resistance, rapid weight gain in early life, uh, and in later life, uh, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, and premature death. Now, turning to uh, the main subject, which is growth, um, in growth hormone, uh, sorry, in uh, SGA, classic growth hormone deficiency is rare. In the starving state, which obviously the SGA infant is, uh, is in, you actually tend to have high growth hormone levels. Growth hormone secretion is part of the metabolic adaptation to starvation. It protects your muscle mass and has other uh, important health consequences. And there's actually a disconnection between growth and growth hormone secretion. So the newborn infant uh, will have high growth hormone levels, but low levels of IGF-1 and IGF-BP3, the growth hormone dependent proteins. Uh, indicating that they're growth hormone insensitive. However, as the infant feeds and recovers and gains weight, then so the growth hormone IGF axis normalizes uh, and testing also normalizes. Uh, there is a significant uh, subset of infants who have elevated IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, indicating they have uh, IGF resistance. And this is particularly seen in Russell Silver syndrome, but also in mutations affecting the IGF-1 gene itself, or more commonly the IGF-1 receptor. And SGA is a very heterogeneous condition uh, with multiple genetic, epigenetic, and environmental aspects to it. So it's, uh, it's a complex area, uh, but essentially uh, growth is a strong marker of a potential underlying uh, significant diagnosis. So if you're not growing well and you were born SGA, uh, it needs a look. So if we look at this cartoon, you can see that the normal situation, the 90% plus situation, follow, uh, if you follow this uh, dark blue line, is that the child, although they're born small, they catch up. Uh, and it's around 80% by two years, 90 plus percent by four years. However, there are a significant number who don't catch up. And actually 20% of short adults started off life as small babies. So it's not an insignificant issue uh, actually as a population issue. Now, what do we do? So the important thing of course is to uh, monitor the, the growth of the child. So length, weight and head circumference uh, initially uh, intensively in the first year, and then you can relax a little. But if you see that the child is not appearing to catch up, then you need to look a bit harder. So if the child is not growing, then you need to look for evidence of nocturnal hypoglycemia, uh, because that is often present and usually unrecognized. And it's actually very, very easy to check. You just look at uh, the presence of urine ketones on a first morning urine sample. So get the parents to stuff some cotton wool balls in the nappy, uh, squeeze the cotton wool ball out onto a, a, a keto stick and see if it's positive. And if it's positive, it means the child is experiencing hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia obviously has chronic ill effects on cognitive uh, development. And so it's a very significant uh, problem of SGA children and it's easy to rectify we just use uh, long-acting cornstarch or frequent overnight feeding to ensure that the glucose doesn't drop. And um, now if you're seeing that a baby is, you know, remaining very small, um, let's say they're nine months old, but they're really very, very small, then you know, there's no need to wait to refer them. You can refer them now. Uh, and certainly if they're small at two years of age, you should be referring them because 
we know that early referral is associated with a much improved outcome. Uh, and sadly, we're often seeing these children with SGA only when they're six to nine years of age. And what really counts for growth is the amount of uh, growth I can get in before puberty starts. Uh, and, you know, you can imagine that uh, if it's uh, a nine-year-old girl and she's experiencing early puberty as a consequence of her SGA, really there's very little opportunity for me to favorably uh, increase her height. And I see a lot of uh, distress regarding height in my clinic. Uh, in terms of, uh, this is a more sort of a general uh, idea of who I'm interested to see, but, you know, so short children, children who are short for their parents. So if your parents are very tall and you're growing on the third percentile, that's still abnormal. If you're growing slowly, which means crossing centiles, or if you want to quantify it, growing at less than 0.3 standard deviations or a reduction of 0.3 standard deviations in one year, Obviously, if you're having unexplained hypoglycemia, that's significant. That could simply be a reflection of SGA. It can also happen in growth hormone deficiency and other conditions. Uh, if there's any midline defects, such as cleft palate or cryptorchidism, uh, this can point to an underlying endocrine disorder. And in children with dysmorphic features or learning disability, uh, then this is another marker of a potential uh, underlying uh, syndromic diagnosis. And here's uh, a picture of Emma, and you'll see that uh, she had severe IUGR in pregnancy. Because she was so small, she was delivered prematurely. Birth weight was only 1.6 kilos, and she had intractable feeding difficulties in the first year of life, requiring prolonged hospitalization, and ultimately ended up with a G-tube. Uh, and, uh, and here's another child, Toby, with severe growth failure. Uh, he had undescended testes, he's hypotonic, you can see at 15 months how small he is, um, and you can see how thin his legs are. He's going to have difficulty walking, isn't he, if, he, if he's got such low tone. He has delayed speech, and he was experiencing hypoglycemia, and this is particularly an issue in the children with a relatively large head. The head may be normal, actually, in terms of uh, it's within the normal range for head circumference, but if it's much larger relative to the rest of the body, then that's the particular group who are at high risk of hypoglycemia. Um, there are numerous uh, genetic causes of SGA, and I'm not going to go through them all because it's far too many to discuss in, in even a day. Um, but obviously problems with the IGF uh, growth hormone axis um, are a common ish issue. But actually uh, what we more commonly see in SGA children is that they have uh, issues with uh, poor feeding and poor tone and, and slow development. Uh, and they often have this issue of relative macrocephaly as well. Uh, and this is very common in Russell Silver syndrome, but also other imprinting disorders such as Temple syndrome, UPD20 and, and others. Uh, Turner syndrome, uh, which can really present at any uh, age in, in a girl's life, is a cause of SGA and short stature or growth failure. So it should be considered and if necessary, to, to do a microarray, preferably, or uh, if not available, a karyotype. There are various microcephalic primordial dwarfism syndromes. Um, Cornelia de Lange is, is probably the commonest that you may see. Um, and, um, and they, I would say nearly all of them are associated with moderate to severe learning disability. Uh, and wouldn't necessarily be candidates for growth hormone treatment, but uh, uh, obviously that is an individual decision depending on the situation. DNA repair defects uh, are important, uh, although very rare, and that an example would be Bloom syndrome. Now, there are many skeletal dysplasias uh, that can cause uh, SGA and postnatal growth failure, although equally, uh, children with skeletal dysplasia may well have a normal birth weight. 
Uh, there's a whole group of disorders called rhizopathies, of which the archetype is Noonan syndrome, but also right up there at the top is neurofibromatosis type 1. And actually, these are, can both be associated with SGA, although that's not a common presentation of these disorders. The issue, of course, with genetic diagnosis in UAE is the difficulty in accessing genetic testing. Uh, and this, has, this is a, a two-edged sword. If you can access the genetic testing, you may actually doom the child uh, not to be covered by insurance because now they have a congenital condition. And so it's almost uh, ridiculous. We're you know, almost prohibited from making the diagnosis for fear of, of what will happen to the child's health. Now here is um, a list of the clinical features of SGA and growth failure. Uh, and these are really common to uh, this condition. So not all children are in this position, but these are very common features, I would say. The triangular face, clinodactyly, which is the uh, shortened curved little finger, the small jaw, um, hypotonia, um, high-pitched voice because of hypoplasia of the larynx. So they have this characteristic squeaky Donald Duck voice. The heels uh, stick out, not, not quite the rocker bottom feet of Edwards syndrome, but uh, they're, they're prominent. And this is particularly seen in 3M syndrome, but also in Russell Silver. Uh, delayed fontanelle closure, the male hypogonadism that I've touched on already. Uh, speech delay, excessive sweating, which if it's happening at night, can also be an indication of hypoglycemia. Uh, teeth crowding from that small jaw. And of course, hypoglycemia, which we've talked about. And actually, a number of these features are, are particularly seen in Russell Silver syndrome, which is what this little girl has. And uh, those of you who can uh, see the picture closely will notice that she has facial asymmetry. Uh, which goes with that condition. So in growth assessment, we're interested in a number of, of uh, features that can point to uh, why this is happening to the child. So one is consanguinity. This is obviously a very important uh, issue in our part of the world. And um, uh, consanguinity greatly increases the risk of otherwise rare autosomal recessive disorders. Another thing that is relatively common in our part of the world is the use of assisted reproductive technology. So ART is strongly associated with uh, uniparental isodisomy uh, and uh, imprinting disorders, such as Prader-Willi syndrome and Russell Silver syndrome. So uh, if that uh, has been used in the uh, conception of the child, that's an important thing to find out. We want to know about the mode of birth and gestation. Obviously, prematurity is, is a further compromise. Uh, and we want to know as much as possible about the measurements, birth weight, birth length, head circumference, and uh, the development of the child. Is there any evidence of disproportion? Are the, uh, the limbs unusually short or is the trunk unusually short? And is there any significant medical history in parents, siblings, or other relations? Five minutes. Uh, I haven't had my time, I have to say. Um, so the bone age is a very important tool for the assessment of abnormal growth and puberty and allows prediction of final height. Uh, and, but it is contingent upon the accuracy of bone age assessment and is extremely helpful for treatment monitoring. Uh, and here is an example of one of the bone ages we have in our institution. You see, I'm not getting a bone age that says that bone age is between one and two years or some such nonsense. I'm getting a bone age of 2.55 years and this allows precision and it allows uh, suitable follow-up and monitoring and adjustment of treatment. The diagnostic approach to SGA is shown here. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this, but essentially, uh, if you have a primary growth disorder, you have to think about uh, underlying genetic causes uh, if you have a secondary disorder, this is things like celiac disease or hypothyroidism. Still, in the end, we often don't have an explanation for why the short child with SGA is not growing well. We use growth hormone in these children because it is extremely effective. Uh, and uh, it's recommended from children over the age of two uh, if they are very short and in slightly older children over the age of four if they're a little less short and provided that they're not showing evidence of catch-up. 
Uh, the starting dose is 35 to 70 micrograms per kilogram per day. Uh, we normally start on 35 at the lower end there of the range. Uh, and we use higher doses in children more severe growth restriction. If we look at this data, this shows data on 79 children uh, in the open circles before treatment with growth hormone in the closed circles following treatment with growth hormone. And you'll see that overwhelmingly uh, the children after growth hormone treatment achieve a height within the normal range. Indeed, some even at, at the upper limit of the normal range. Uh, so the children grow extremely well with growth hormone. More than 90% of children who receive growth hormone for the SGA indication respond very well to growth hormone and achieve a height within the normal range. Uh, and this uh, is uh, a very important uh, consideration because without growth hormone treatment, they're very unlikely to. As I mentioned earlier, puberty can happen early. Uh, SGA children often start puberty at an early age, particularly if they're obese, and many SGA children do become obese in childhood. Um, uh, and this is particularly true of girls. The growth hormone dose doesn't particularly seem to affect age of puberty onset, um, but we do see a significant minority with premature adrenarche and precocious puberty. Uh, and it's important to monitor bone age closely on treatment and if necessary to intervene to uh, prevent puberty progressing until an appropriate age. If I just uh, focus up here on the adult height data, you'll see compared with the zero, where the children are all short, by the end of growth at adult height, you can see that overwhelmingly the children are achieving an adult height within the normal range. And this is what we're after with growth hormone treatment. The typical height gain, if you start at an appropriate age, is around nine to 11 centimeters. Growth hormone has other benefits other than growth. It improves cognitive development uh, and improves quality of life and metabolic status. Uh, how do we get better growth? Well, we can use higher doses, but what we really want is to start, age, uh, start treatment at an appropriate age. And the taller the child is when they start, the taller they will be when they finish, it goes without saying. If they have tall parents, that also helps. But the elephant in the room really is adherence. Unfortunately, 70% of uh, children have adherence issues with growth hormone. Uh, and that is uh, the fly in the ointment really with growth hormone. It's a daily injection and that is a challenge. Here is data on the benefits of earlier treatment. And if you just focus on the turquoise line at the top, you'll see that children who started treatment in year one uh, are already experiencing better growth than if they started within the age range two to five years compared with those over eight uh, who uh, uh, can actually had a rather poor growth response. So essentially, if you start under the age of five, you're going to get twice as good a growth response uh, from growth hormone treatment. Uh, here is a case of a patient of mine who started growth hormone treatment uh, just over two years of age, around 27 months. And you can see her weight on the left-hand side is not very good, but her height has grown uh, excellently and she's now almost got a height in the normal range. Uh, so that's a very good response. So in summary, SGA is an important cause of growth failure in children. However, 90% of SGA children do catch up with no question of needing growth hormone treatment. So this talk isn't for them really, but I think it is important to uh, 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 consider that there are those who don't catch up and often it is very clear at a much earlier stage than two or four years of age that they're not going to catch up. A child who is you know minus six standard deviations at 18 months is not going to catch up. Uh, so uh, you can refer them at an appropriate early stage. Growth hormone is proven to be safe and effective for SGA and has other benefits and earlier treatment is more effective, particularly actually on the cognitive development. So uh, with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and look forward to uh, receiving questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nandu, for a very 
clear and comprehensive presentation. It's a very interesting topic and obviously, uh, I mean, sorry to rush you because we were running late, it's not your fault. In terms of uh, age at onset, there is a question about whether you can consider growth hormone treatment at under two years of age. Do you have any comments? Yes, I do uh, use growth hormone under the age of two. If it's clear, I, I gave the example of someone being minus six standard deviations. And actually, I do see children like that. Uh, and if you wait until they're two, you're just wasting time. They're never going to catch up by age two. So uh, there's no point in waiting in that situation. Better to get on with treatment. And in the SGA indication, I mean, is it related to the insurance uh, company that will cover it? Or I mean, is it some cover, some don't? Or? Uh, well, this is always, this is an ongoing problem in UAE. There are uh, insurance companies that refuse to cover any hormonal therapy. Uh, we try to help um, patients who are having to, to pay for growth hormone. We can direct them to uh, centers where growth hormone is available at the lower cost, or maybe they are able to uh, get it from home. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's, growth hormone is much, much cheaper, for example, in, in Jordan or Egypt or Turkey or India. So it, it's uh, sometimes this is uh, what families have to resort to, to get the treatment if it's not covered by insurance. Uh, so also, much. I should add that uh, there is a, a scheme coming shortly from Novo, in fact, to support families who uh, 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 are struggling with the issue of cost if they're not covered by insurance. Thank you, I'm sure that would be very helpful. Thank you for your talk again. And I mean, we couldn't see any other questions, but if you see them, uh, you can answer them by typing the answer on the chat uh, question.